Sam Shoemaker wrote a poem, I Stand by the Door. I liken this poem to being the church. I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It is the door through which men walk when they find God. There's no use my going way inside and staying there when so many are still outside. And they, as much as I, crave to know where the door is. And all that so many ever find is only the wall where a door ought to be. They creep along the wall like blind men with outstretched groping hands, feeling for a door, knowing there must be a door. Yet they never find it. So I, I stand by the door. The most tremendous thing in the world is for men to find that door, the door that leads to God. The most important thing any man can do is to take hold of one of those blind groping hands and put it on the latch, the latch that only clicks and opens to the man's own hand. Men die outside that door as starving beggars die on cold nights in cruel cities in the dead of winter. They die for want of what is within their grasp. They live on the other side of that door. They live to find it. Nothing else matters compared to helping them find the door and open it and walk in it and find him. So I stand by the door. Go in, go in, great saints, go all the way in. Go way down into the cavernous cellars and way up into the spacious attics, into the vast roomy house, this house where God is. Go into the deepest of hidden casements of withdrawal, of silence, of sainthood. Some must inhabit those inner rooms and know the depths and the heights of God and then call outside to the rest of us how wonderful it is inside. Sometimes I take a deeper look in. Sometimes I venture a little farther in, but my place seems to be a little closer to the opening. So I stand by the door. The people too far in do not see how near some are to leaving. Those too far in seem preoccupied with the wonder of it all. Somebody must watch for those who have just entered the door but would like to run away. So for them too, I stand by the door. I admire the people who go way in, but I wish, I wish they would not forget how it was before they got in then they would be able to help the people who have not even found the door or the people who want to run away again from God. You can go too deeply in and you can stay too long and you can forget the people outside the door. As for me, I shall take my old accustomed place near enough to God to hear him and know he is there but not so far from men as not to hear them. And remember, they are there too. Where? Outside the door. Thousands of them, millions of them, billions of them. But more important for me, one of them, two of them, ten of them, whose hands I am intended to put on the latch. So, I shall stand by the door and wait for those who seek it. I had rather be a doorkeeper. So, I stand by the door. The show you are about to watch is aimed at making you, the viewer, well acquainted with what's called the estuary protocol. Hypothetically, this protocol could be used in any setting where two or more are gathered for the purposes of dialogue. 
In this show, there will quite possibly be many references made about the church, God, religion, doctrine, and other spiritual expressions. Estuary itself is not a sectarian or confessional organization. All are welcome. Again, the purpose of this show is to highlight the estuary protocol and show it in action. Thank you very much and enjoy. Greetings and welcome to the Friday Morning Nameless. I'm Chad the Alcoholic, and today we're going to have the greatest show that ever happened on the internet. I mean, maybe, maybe it won't, maybe it will. I'm not sure. As you can see, I've discovered new buttons on the stream yard. I'm trying new things where I am actually um, kind of experimenting with stuff just because I can and I paid for it. So why the hell not? So today we're having ourselves a not estuary show, and I have several guests. I shall bring them up in a second. And uh, yeah, no, this is going to be great. I'm really excited. Everybody stick around. We're going to have a great show, and I'm being really weird. And with that, we shall go to, here's the panelists, the panelists. <laughs> oh, welcome, <laughs> welcome. Okay, so um, we are coming off of a, of a fresh and hot weekend um slash week of the northwest estuary uh pacific northwest estuary up in uh washington washington state uh in the united states of america and so um we're all quite exhausted and well i'll just speak for myself exhausted <laughs> and excited for this and we shall see what happens mcmosev is hungry and eating um, so we're going to start, I normally start this, I'm going to give the all cards round just so anybody who's never seen the show, this is what's going to happen. This is going to be a four part thing called the estuary protocol. That's the whole point of the show is to help show you how the protocol works. And you could take this, I think anywhere you can put it on your soccer team. You could put it at your factory on the job site, uh, church adjacent. You can put it in a submarine if you want. I don't care wherever you want to put it. I think it works. And, and if it doesn't, here, here's what I'd like you to do. Here, let me do this. Let me, let, me, let me do this. Let me do this. I'd like you to try this anywhere. Just do, use the protocol. Try it. Actually try it. And tell me where it doesn't work. I'll give you five bucks. But only if you can prove that it didn't actually work. Okay. Bring the panelists back up. Welcome, panelists. Here we go. I'm going to press all rounds card just to give everybody... A quick rundown on what the Estuary Protocol looks like. Round one. Introduce yourself. Tell us about yourself. What's your name? Where are you from? What brings you here? And what are you hoping to find? Round two. Topics to be laid on the table. You may pass this round if you choose. The topics are intellectual, personal, contextual, or estuary. Round three. Upvote the topics. You may not pass this round, but point out what topic seems most interesting to you, preferably not your own. Round four. The discussion begins. Now talk freely, but remember the real key here is to listen well. Enjoy. Okay, well, as you've seen, we have our four uh, rounds of the estuary protocol, and I'm very excited to do this. Um, also, guys, all the panelists, I forgot to tell you, I'm using my laptop for the first time to, to use StreamYard. So if it takes a shiz app, then I'll, um, I'll just dip out and then grab my phone. Just don't stop if I go kaputs okay so we'll i'll press the round one and then what we'll do is we'll start with mcmosive 
and then we'll go over to Matthew, and then we'll go over to Claire, and then we'll go all the way up and over to that Alan dude, and then to Sherry, and then to Neil. So that will be the order, uh, basically counterclockwise. All right, so here we go. Any questions so far? No questions? Questions? All right. Round one. Introduce hmm. yourself. Tell us about yourself. What's your name? Where are you from? What brings you here? And what are you hoping to find? My name's Mick Mo. I'm from the SAV. That's why my name is longer Mick Mo Sav. Um, I'm here because I love Chad and I've grown to love Estuary and everyone else on the screen. And I'm hoping to get out of it. What am I trying to get out of it? I hope to one day be more rich and famous than Alan. Well played, sir. Well played. Matthew. You are muted. Hello, I'm Matthew uh, Walker, Texas LARPer here in uh, West Texas, uh, originally from North Florida, the good part of Florida. Um, I'm here because Chad asked me and I really enjoy these and I enjoy this uh, community, the fellowship that is here. Um, and I'm hoping to, uh, I kind of have one goal with these mostly is to just try and as, as a big extrovert and I can talk, 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 and like uh, Mo said in the in the pre-studio there that sometimes I can talk and I don't have anything to say and that's, that's probably not wise. So I'm gonna try and listen as well as I can. Sweet. Clara. Hi, I'm Clara, um, also known as Sociology Clara, and I'm here because what a privilege it is to be asked to come hang out with y'all. Uh, what a good group. Um, and I'm here, I guess, I guess to be, to, to see and be seen, um, I think is the answer. You stole my line, Clara. That's oh. so beautiful. Thank you. Alan. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Alan. I live in New York City, and uh, yeah, I, I love Estuary, and I like like this group of people, you know. And I also, you know, there's McMo as well, uh, as well as the people I like, and uh, yeah, so I get to hang out with all of you, and McNo Mo. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry. My name is Sherry. Um, I'm from Canada, in 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 British Columbia. And I'm here because Chad invited me, and I'm so grateful, Chad, that you've been inviting me to these because I don't have an estuary where I live, probably never will, and so this is my estuary. And um, I'm looking forward to some really good conversation because that's what I love. Beautiful. Thank you, Sherry. Yes, this is your estuary. You will be invited to everyone. So, <laughs> Neil. I'm Neil, originally from central New Jersey, been in Wisconsin for nine years now, uh, New Orleans for 10 years. And uh, I consider all of you friends, even McMo and even Alan. <laughs> and uh, I, I am uh, increasingly convinced, as Sherry has been saying, that uh, this is a thing and this is real. And I want to be part of it. So that's it. Thank you, Neil. My name's Chad. I'm an alcoholic uh, or known as Chad the alcoholic, whatever, or this guy in a mask. I, uh, I really... Um, I tripped over this little corner of the internet uh, several years ago, and um, through that whole uh, adventure, was um, uh, was was there when when Paul and John John Van Donk created the estuary and the estuary protocol, and I loved what they were doing, and I wanted to be a part of that, so I've um, done some of that, and I wanted to kind of uh, bring the uh, a little bit of as much as we could bring uh, in in this format, which is a recorded format. Now, an actual estuary that's not gonna, you're not going to record. So that, that's what mm -hmm. I'm I'm hoping to find. As what you know, that's what I'm looking for. I, I love the relationships that I built here, and um, <clears throat> I want to try and be as helpful as I can, and have fun doing it. And uh, so there is that. Any questions? Great. Round two. Topics to be laid around. on the table. You may pass this round if you choose. The topics are intellectual, personal, contextual, or estuary. All 
All right. Um, I didn't know what I was going to say. I was actually planning on passing, but I thought of something because I was, I didn't have enough time to watch a full video before this, uh, but I had enough time to doom scroll through YouTube shorts. Um, <laughs> and so that's what I did. And actually one of them was very thought provoking. And it's not really that important. Uh, I mean, I could tell you guys <laughs> it's important to me, but I actually need to do a little bit more chewing on the first half of the video. Um, and it's very personal. And I'm reminded now by Chad's uh, kind of end of what you just said that, yeah, this is recorded. So not a real <laughs> life estuary where I should just divulge the secrets of my family. Um, mm -hmm. But my so it's at least going to be intellectual and contextual to some extent, maybe not as far as personal. But um, so it was a video of a philosopher talking about families. And the way that he was talking about it was basically how oftentimes a, a child's personality will be essentially like in relationship to what's expected from them by the parents. And so that the idea is kind of like that the family tells the child who he or she needs to be. And, you know, if the parents are, uh, you know, rich, like good, at, good at school or bad at school. Like if you, if your parents need you to be intellectually sharp and make good grades, then that'll, have certain types of personality um, results um, down the line. And, and he laid out a whole list of things. But you guys, I think, understand the, the basic premise is that kind of the, the power of nurture, we'll say. Um, and it struck me because he, he kind of used the term like the general family or like um, – he, he was talking about the family as this, as if it existed as a platonic form. Um, and it struck me as the type of thing that Kierkegaard would um, strike out at because of basically with the question of from, from whence do you stand to have this unbiased view on the capital F family? Um, and, mm -hmm. and so that kind of weird thing in which I come from a certain type of family. And so how, how, how am I ever to escape my nature and nurture? And why do I think that I can kind of have this third, you know, third person objective view, even on very spiritual and mystical matters about kind of some sort of generalization about who I should be. Um, and, and yeah, what I must, I have a certain personality and I can see how my parents, uh, you know, shaped me in certain ways. But it's weird. It's like, how can I even say that? Like, what am I comparing it to? Am I comparing it to other people and their families? You know, or like, am I trying to, am I imagining some platonic form of me that had different parents? Like adoption's real. So that, you know, you can run that experiment with twins, I guess, but it's still, it's very, uh, so I guess it's the idea of family and personal individualistic, not individualistic in the bad sense, but just like the experience of being an individual in a family and how can we think through that without kind of um, stepping over our bounds or how do we escape, you know, our own personal stories in order to kind of even talk about that. Hmm. So something like formation and familiar fa familial personhood. Yeah. Okay. A better way to put it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Matthew. Yeah, I usually have uh, something that's been on my mind for a while, but this one kind of just popped in. Um, and it's, to a degree, it's something I care a lot and think about a lot about. And there's two goobers here that are going to be just perfect for this topic. But um, humor, humor uh, in the general sense, uh, humor as it goes as the prefix of human uh, and uh kind of humor as uh, as it relates to philosophy, theology, spirituality, wisdom. Um, yeah, and that, that prefix of, of human, human also tied to homo sapien, the wise man, uh, philosophy, the love of wisdom. Hmm. Um, I think there's a, there's a little bit of a coalescence or a constellation there. That's what I got. Excellent. Well, thank you. Clara. Um, so the, the thing I'm thinking about, um, and, and I think I've heard people in other streams maybe talking about this, um, 
I have this Northwest Estuary High. Like, what a fun event. What a good time. Um, and I'm just, I'm wondering, I, I think this is just a common question to ask, but I'm wondering, how do we take that and, and put it into um, our everyday lives? And, and I know Chad probably has some thoughts about this. I know lots of folks do. So um, to me, that's just a salient topic that's been on my mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I'm trying to think, wait, before we get on. So like, I'm trying to, like that specifically, or like, how do we take our experiences that are meaningful and embody them? Is that a good way of putting it? Sure, yeah. Okay. Alan. Uh, yeah. Uh, what I was thinking about was uh, this conversation of sort of estuary and churches has come up a few times, and it seems semi-controversial, I guess. Some people prefer not to have uh, it in, in churches, but not that direct conversation, but the conversation around um, the conversation around sort of every place you go has its own spirit and its own influence on you. And I think it tags into with McMo's sort of idea of like, I think people, especially because churches have this like old stodgy, like, oh, that's where I went when I was 12 and I stopped going when I was 14, you know? And like, well, that's a weird spirit. We don't like that. But like, if we went to a cafe, that would be a neutral spirit. And just the idea of like, there are no neutral spirits. The cafe would have its own spirit. You know, people would be eating food and drinking coffee and, you know, bar, people would be drinking alcohol. That would have its own spirit. A public library would have its own spirit. And, you know, there are even studies that, you know, depending on where people vote, if they vote at a public school or if they vote in an office building, that that cha influences or changes who they vote for. Um, so just the idea of like every place has a spirit and there's no such thing as a neutral spirit. Hmm. Interesting. You know what I thought of there, just to pollute your um, share a little bit, was expectations as a form, which is kind of weird. I don't even know what mm -hmm. that means. <laughs> but <clears throat> I don't even know what a form is. Just <laughs> tell me to shut up. Sherry. Well, the first thing that popped into my mind was because of the conference, and I'm thinking about all the goings on at the conference. Um, I'm wondering about, um, I don't even know how to phrase it. Like, w is what we experienced at the conference a kind of ecumenicism? Is estuary a kind of ecumenicism? What is ecumenicism? How does ecumenicism fit into a lot of theological paradigms? Um, yeah, I'm thinking about ecumenicism actually for, you know, coming away from the conference kind of thing. Mm, and, excellent. um, yeah, so that's about it. Thank you, Sherry. Nail. My topic is, uh, what does it mean to die to self? Mm. And I want to reference first Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And also uh, Matthew 16, which is um, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? That's my topic. Whoa. Oh, a little one. <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, my name is Chad. Oh, I already did that. Um, I don't have a topic. I'm going to pass on this round. And um, we'll press this and go in the same order that we were. Round in. three. Upvote the topics. You may not pass this round, but point out what topic seems most interesting to you. Preferably not your own. Well, I just want to go ahead and say that I definitely don't want to talk about humor. 
I'd rather be funny than talk about it. And as soon as we start talking about it, it'll be very unfunny. Um, and just my, I, I would prefer to continue to be funny instead of being, you know, a nerd about something I love. Um, so that's not really what you're supposed to do, I guess. Um, I mean, I do want to talk about it, but you know, like I said, I'd prefer to be funny. Um, I think that Allen's and Sherry's seem somewhat connected in my mind. The idea of ecumenicism and the kind of non-neutral spirit that is unique to each community. And maybe that would maybe that would tie in some of um, Clara's as well. Um, I think I would love to hear an hour long conversation with everyone here about what it means to die daily um so yeah hard to me to pick but i think if i had to choose one it would probably be sherry's ecumenicism thank you matt i'm All gonna right. uh, i'm gonna try and be bold because i think i see a, a a coalescence of them um with the technical framing of the agent arena relationship and so i think uh where you are, uh, where and how you are coupled in the, the family dynamic and where and how you are uh, approaching a ecumenical uh, endeavor uh, can all be subject to a sacrifice of the self, which can be a mini fractal or microcosm of the death of the, the, the mm -hmm. dying of the self. Um, so I'm going to try and be the weirdo and, and throw out a synthesis there. But overall, if I had to choose, I think I would say, I think I'm going to go Moe's with the family dynamic. <clears throat> Sweet. Um, I, I think maybe this is a little bit similar to what, what Matthew was saying, but, but I saw a connection between, uh, between Neil's topic, dying to self, and this might not all be related to what you're saying, Matthew. I'm sorry. Um, maybe I'm just thinking with my own topic. But but I was thinking of the, there might be a connection between this relationship that McMo was talking about between the individual and sort of where they come from, their family, nurture, nature, those types of questions, and between sort of what Neil was talking about in terms of, of dying to self. I just wonder if sort of moving out of your family and, and, and these social forces that shape you um is also a form of dying to self i wonder if that is going what well, might, might be part of what's going on there so i don't know that so i was just kind of trying to relate those two to each other um sort of seeing that being a, a united topic hmm. Alan. Alan. uh yeah I, I i guess i see uh uh like a growing of like the con the, the idea of like across a lot of these of like participating in larger bodies or metaphysical bodies. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, we're going to have inhabit a lot of bodies. So uh, how how those integrate with each other. So I guess it has to do with sort of Sherry's topic of like ecumenicism and, and you have the particular your particular religion or lack of faith or whatever. But can you come together and form a different body and participate together? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, it's my turn. I was waiting yeah, for Neil. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I, I too, Alan, see kind of like I, you know, the lo the longer you talk about these things, the more they merge. <laughs> um, but yeah, like the dying to self, the what is the spirit, um, the you know, what I wrote for like a subtext McMo for years was, is this fate destiny or is this providence, grace and mercy, right? Um, I think those are all related to ecumenicism. And then for my topic, I actually wrote a subtext that said family question mark, because actually Matthew and I were just talking about this with Nate on the live stream this morning. Um, and and I think we could actually cover humor and Claire's topic, Clara's top topic here if we just like play doh <laughs> this all together a little bit mm -hmm. because um, you know when you have those experiences, when you experience this 
body, this new body, this neutral spirit or whatever you do, you are going to have and we experience that at the conference and a late of, you know, hopefully that happens. Experience. And and then what do you do with that? Because I think that this space affords that. And I don't think that it, it doesn't impact the world. Like, I think it actually impacts the world. That's what makes it real to me. Uh, because if it's impacting me, it's impacting the world around me, like it just is, right? So, um, so I think that that actually would, Clara's topic fit right in there nicely, you know, because then what do you do with this, you know, sense of community, family, spirit, and, and, and as far as McMo's thing goes, it's also a, a, for, a kind of an individuation as well, in, you know, fitting into there, right? Because it's only through the other that we actually find out who we are, <laughs> McMo, <laughs> right? Like that's who we, that's where we discover ourselves. So I'm kind of, you know, I want, I want to share. <laughs> I want everybody's topic. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. I I also want to synthesize a little bit. So my number one would be Sherry's. What is ecumenicism? And I've been fascinated this space with this space because of that question. I I don't think I genuinely do not think what we're doing has ever been done in human history. And so there's a little bit of pride within me that I, I get to be on the vanguard of something. And it, there's in the trickster in me, the, the punk in me is like, we are hiding in plain sight what we're doing. It's not a secret. It's not a secret to anyone. And yet I know what we're doing here is unprecedented. It's a secret, and, and but it's beautiful. an open secret. Yeah, correct. And so it's, it's, this, it's this complete openness. And yet at the same time, this complete veiling that's not apparent at all. And I, I love it. I love that juxtaposition. And mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's incredible. And the ecumenicism that's that's happening, whether we like it or not. Um, so, and then tying that to McMo, McMo would be my second. The nature of uh, family, and and I was thinking. So, as you were talking, several of you, I was thinking about PVK sincerity and authenticity culture, and how we've been moving from sincerity culture, honoring your family, your ancestors, your traditions, over to an authenticity culture of wherever my heart pulls me there I will go. Um, and then I think, I think what we're doing is somewhat of a third way. Um, and the reason I say that is because I've been, I was an authentic Neil for 10 years, something like that. Like I've been there. Um, like I, I know where that path leads. I think Chad knows also where that path leads the authentic self, but the sincerity culture, I do not, feel this need to like reestablish the, 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 it's very, it's very hard to explain. I don't feel a need to reestablish what, let's say 1600, 1600s or 1500s or 14, you know, the, the level of connection and relationship there. And then I think of Jesus saying, who is my brother? Who is my mother? Who is my sister? But one who mm -hmm. does the will of the one above. So I'm, I'm, it, I don't think we're making this overtly religious, but I think what what the ecumenicism is that's connecting all of us is something like we're all searching for the one, whatever the one is that binds us and, and guides us. And we're all connected through that search, through that pursuit of, of the genuine search for, for truth and goodness and beauty. Um, and that's the third way, as I see it. Uh, yeah, so those are my votes. Excellent. <clears throat> you guys hear that that thumping that's going on up there? No, you're good. 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 Oh wow. There's um uh uh so somebody yeah. I guess what's kind of synthesizing for me is um uh uh Sherry said Plato, like the Plato. But then I thought Plato, and then I Plato. thought of the, 
I thought of the forms again. I mean, and what do you do with Plato? But you know, forms. Very nice, actually. And, and like I know that's really corny, but um, I so like and kind of what happened over the weekend. Perhaps why it was so stark and shocking and um, kind of like uh, maybe jarring is that uh, to 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 be as um, uh, as foolish as Neil and to say perhaps it's never been done. I don't know. Maybe that there was that was the only time that that particular form could show up. I don't know. Uh, a clashing of spirits, a clashing of whatever. And so I know all you people out there that are watching and say, Chad, you're just an asshole. Stop talking like that. But I'm serious. It was, you had to have been there. Anybody that was there, I know. My guess McMo is and anybody... I missed McMo and I missed Woodstock and we're going to be making up for it ever since. No, seriously, I had this, this, uh, sorry to interrupt Chad, but I had this like monologue running through my head where I, I'm t like somehow and it's, this is almost involuntary, but it's saying to Neil, like never again, you're not missing these. <laughs> well, the big difference here is anybody was at, who was at Woodstock that claims that they are at Woodstock is full of shit. Cause nobody can remember Woodstock. Um, so I had that I had that same monologue, Neil, after Chino or at Thunder Bay and Chino. I had a chance to go to both of them. So don't we got to get into the next round, boys. Stop breaking protocol. The ordered one. Um, <clears throat> what was I going to say? Um, so yeah, honestly, I don't. I, okay, so I am interested in Sherry's topic: the what is ecumenicism, and then what Alan was also saying. Um, but. You know, to synthesize that with with um, Neil's um, extra topic of sincerity, authenticity, because as Clara knows, that was something that was came up in our estuary meeting, and um, that seems to be kind of like an underlying um, thing that's always kind of that you can always kind of run it through those frames. So that's what I have. Uh, oh my goodness, I am losing my space here. My space. Oh my gosh. My computer is acting like it's trying to load a MySpace page right now. All right, here's round four. Round four. The discussion begins. Now talk freely, but remember the real key here is to listen well. Enjoy. Neil, we've we got. All, we should all. Oh. Uh... I was going to oh. talk over. I want everybody to talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, Sherry, as soon as I heard your voice, I was like, nope, I'm done. <laughs> I respect you I, all I far to too much. I wanted to just like do the talk yeah, freely. Yeah. Thing. I was, taking over I was just going to say. Really lame today. You're lame, Alan, today. <laughs> on, get with the program. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> well, we don't do that. Um <laughs> <laughs> Some of us live in cities where we have to follow rules, Sherry, okay? <laughs> we, we live in a society, okay? We can't all just be Neil and Matthew just being like, oh, I'm, I, in the futures of my life, I endeavor to be at the next uh, conference. There's no room for FOMO in a uh, Christian's life. Neil, I'm rebuking you in the name of the Lord. Look thee unto the new heavens and new earth. And I'm going to pull a George W., so fool me once, shame on you. <laughs> fool me twice. You ain't gonna get fooled again. <laughs> um okay, so I I really need to know what is ecumenicism because you know I've heard um recently Jonathan Pajot talking with uh the one dude that's like trying to sell the supras on the internet. Um the the supra seller dude, the yeah, which kind of bothers me. It's a little bothersome me, to me, but anyways, me too, me um, too. That yeah, it's kind of weird. It's like, hey, hey, we we got the supra bitch. You can come on whatever. Anyways, um he one thing that Peugeot said in that conversation is that I really appreciated was that he is he has his spiritual advisors, he has his father, his spiritual father, and and his other fellows that he's really close with that he that he relies upon for spiritual direction and he one of the questions he wants to make sure is he's not leaning too much into ecumenicism now i don't know what that is i think even my own pastor has um has like some kind of 
warnings about that for me, but nobody's ever explained to me what is the deal with ecumenicism being uh, a, a problem. Now, I'm from AA. <laughs> uh, <laughs> talk about ecumenicism. Holy cannoli. Oh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so like, I mean, I don't have a personal problem with it. What I have noticed is the more Christian I, the longer I become a Christian, the more the um, there's like a, kind of like a, a like a like a rigid eel that happens where I <laughs> get kind of more weirded out by people of other faiths or uh, basically it's it's not but it's not my Christianity that's doing that I think it's my opinionated thinking that's doing that because I don't I, think I don't, yeah. I think that there's a sense in which you asking us what ecumenicism is, is kind of like asking Robin Hood what theft is. Um, because Who, Chad or me, no, Chad, Chad asking yeah. like just for the definition of ecumenicism, because in some senses, it also is like what Neil's saying, like this is a high point in the history of church ecumenicism. Like this conversation right now is a high point, you know? Um, because I was raised much like a parent. I didn't watch the Peugeot interview with the super guy, but apparently that's, that's pretty funny. Um, but, um, but yeah, that, that there's a sense in which, especially for like a new Christian, um, ecumenicism would be quite dangerous because it would be an avenue by which false teaching could get a hold of you and it could, um, cause you to become a heretic basically and and mo in most uh communities especially especially religious communities being a heretic is not get is not given attention and status like it is here <laughs> is is, ec is ecumenicism uh restricted only to christians or is it can it also be uh cross uh religious like total total like beyond the even abrahamic uh traditions well, let me read a definition. I got it right up here. So definitions of ecumenicism for Christianity, the doctrine of the ecumenical movement that promotes cooperation and better understanding among different religious denominations aimed at universal Christian unity and um as far as I know there are ecumenical councils which include Orthodox Jews. I don't know about Islam. Not sure if they would participate, but um, I think it would be mostly within the Christian faith. But I have heard of ecumenical groups meeting that included Orthodox Jews. So, oh. Glenn, Glenn, Scribner just had a, Glenn Scribner just had a video uh, really going at the Pope. Uh, who's taken on like a, a super, uh, 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 an uber perennialist uh, perspective. He was in Singapore at some uh, cross religious uh, event. And so that, that's kind of where I was, I was just, I, and obviously, you know, we're, we're in TLC, we have some understanding, some charity. Um, I, I just, I just wasn't sure if, if that is like a, a discrete category where no ecumenic, ecumenicism is just uh, Christian only. Uh, that's all I was trying to dig down. It's interesting because this very... morning I was at a meeting where I was at a meeting this morning where at the end of the meeting we all closed with the Lord's Prayer. And there was me, who was a Lutheran, and then there was like a Catholic next to me. And then just like five guys down, there's a Muslim dude. And then a few other pe people away is like an atheist. And then there's like a Jewish person. <laughs> and then there's somebody who like worships, worships or like nature and crystals. So it's like that's. And it works so well. It works so well that. But what? See, we're, I guess we're not worshiping together, though, right? So, so but we will pray together. I, what, I what, I, think... what I, yeah, what what I think is different with us compared to the conventional, is that for two hundred years, well, actually, since for a long time, the pressure to conform or the the pressure to be a certain type, let's say a Catholic or a CRC or this or that it was it's that sincerity culture it's where i was born into it's outward in you know it, it's defining and so I'll, I'll give you i'll give you an example 
uh, with me. Like McMo is one of my best friends in this space and he's a universalist. And of all the ideas that are floated in this space, like I, I am most <laughs> averse to universalism or it's one of the ideas that I have the biggest issue with. Um, and we've talked about, I don't want to get into universalism, but like, why, why do I feel it? Like inevitable part of it is that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a weirdo, but like, I think it's because within this space, I think we each have a sufficient amount of faith that we're able to be vulnerable to other people's ideas. And the, the way I think of vulnerability is the willingness to be changed by the other, whatever it is. And because, because within this space, so many of us are inward out people, meaning we, we first have come to our, our own kind of authenticity or whatever you want to call that conclusions. And then we're, we're moving outward into the world from that inward out structure. We're, we're less worried about the external influences on us. And, and I would say we're more guided by a genuine pursuit of making sense of this crazy metamodern time. Like whatever, whatever is going on, we sense that like the existing structures are insufficient for dealing with the modern time, but we're all united in that pursuit. Um, and so like, I, I, I could, I do care about the fact that me and McMo disagree on this thing, but I, I care more about the fact that like, I'm probably going to learn an immense amount over time from McMo and he's, he might even learn something from me. Who knows? Sure. Sure. Do you want to speak? Oh, well, I think one of the, I just wanted to make this part clear. I think the problem with some, well, with all the religious denominations or groups or whatever, how you want to put it, faiths, with ecumenicism is this idea of a universal Christian unity, which I actually also have a problem with. Because I, I think that when that happens, we lose the diversity that Chad's experiencing in AA, right? We lose that kind of texture and color and, and I'm not talking about people's skin color. I mean, you know, it's a fabric, right? We are a fabric of humanity woven together, all those wonderful, you know, descriptions. And if we, if, if, you know, if hierarchies, you know, I use the term upper crust crusties today. <laughs> if the upper crusties are shooting for some kind of, you know, gelatinous muck, I'm out, right? Like, it's like, no, that's not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not interested in that. But yeah. don't like, okay, I just want to read you something because Chad, I saw, I didn't watch it, but I saw you did a morning, I think it was a morning stream this, this morning about communion of the saints. Was it this morning you did that? And then in my course. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, and did you hear that in the live stream with Paul yesterday? Did you hear him say that? We're working our way through the Apostles' Creed? Yeah, that, yeah, that kind of blew my mind. I was like, holy shit. Okay, so this morning in, in my course with Michael Martin, we read Sirach. Chapter 24. So everybody write that For down. For the and... Protestants in the audience, that's part of the Bible. Sirach. Boo, boo. Heresy, it's heresy. Of, it's actually part of the wisdom literature. So it fits in with Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Bill, all those books, okay? And it says here, and it's and this is written in the first person by wisdom herself, Okay. And it says here, and I took root in an honorable people and in the portion of my God, his inheritance. And my abode is in the full assembly of the saints. And Nate was in the class this morning too. And when I, I was reading this out loud, when I got to that portion, I, my heart just jumped because I thought right away of what Paul said in the stream of how, you know, we're working our way through the Apostles' Creed, and now we're at the communion of the saints. And and so, and I have been thinking about ecumenicism because I had some people ask me some questions about what I thought of the conference and in that vein. And when Paul said that yesterday, and then I read this today, I thought, it, you know, communion of the saints. This is not a flat, one-dimensional monotonous gelatinous muck 
And actually the screen is demonstrating beautifully. Like we are all really in a bubble, <laughs> each one of us, right? But here we are having a conversation with each other, loving each other as Clara experienced and Alan and Chad and Matthew and the other losers in the room didn't come, but, but, uh, yeah, not Neil and not. Anyway, Neil. those are just my random thoughts. I just had to get that out because it's, it's like, it's actually making me have high blood pressure thinking about this, just so you know, and I'm not worried about myself. Well, and I, I think, <clears throat> I think it's why we feel so, or let me speak for myself. It's why I feel so, uh, Proper, correct. I feel so. You know, we have that. Uh, say what you think. Uh, uh, you know, try your best and and and, and let it let let the let the cards fall where they may. Um, mm -hmm. You know, aim aim at what you see is good, and and you know, uh, re reality will have it shake out. And it's why I feel like I'm okay with so much of my time and attention here because I think we are a microcosm, a a a a body that is that is exemplifying that unity through the multiplicity the, the unity that is that is underneath uh, uh, all multiplicity and so there's there's a there's a way that to, to go back to the upper crusties this is going to touch a little bit me and Sherry's conversation there's a way that you can become you know an elite in a, in a institution and and lose the lose the picture of of actually trying to pursue the one, actually trying to pursue the ultimate true, the ultimate good and the beautiful, where if if it's gonna take uh, a, a grassroots, if it's gonna take an actual, uh, you know, a, a, a body of people reigniting, uh, reinvigorating a, a, a true communion, a true common unity of, of mm. not doctrine, of not dogma, right? It's not that, it's not that Nate and, and Mo want to figure out who's going to become the universalist and who's not. It's, it's that in this space, in this agent arena dynamic, because perhaps when Neil gets into, you know, his personal life and he meets uh, somebody at his church talking about universalism, perhaps he has a little bit different view. Perhaps he, he speaks about it a little bit differently, you know, but, but it's, it's what it's, is what the the spirit here to try and bring into the, the, a little bit of Alan's. It's like we've I think we've got the spirit right, and so we're allowed to have these mm -hmm. these these diverse and and just you know varying perspectives and, and and starting points. But we all have recognized this thing has broken. The institutions have broken. The elites have have have, have, lo have lost their, their way, and so it's it's up to us. It's up to it, it's. It's it's like it's like Neil said with with uh, the universalism. I I don't, you know, I, I went down a political rabbit hole for you know almost three years. I don't want it. I do not want to dunk I, rhetoric, talk about. It. I don't want none of it. I want to sit here with people that I enjoy, people that make me laugh, people that make me think, people that absolutely teach me stuff. And I want to try and aim for aim for something better, aim for something more true, more good, more beautiful mm -hmm. in this broken situation. Right? Save your dunks for when we ball out at Midwestuary 2025. I just Actual want to dunks. say that Alan's, you know, you mentioned spirit and, and uh, Alan's question was, what is spirit, right? Is there a neutral spirit? And then Neil wanted to know about dying to self. And so, and I actually think that those things fit into this category of ecumenicism too, right? Like, because how much, how much of like, what is the spirit? you know, you're talking about the spirit of this space as something that is, um, you know, conducive to having relationship with people who ne don't necessarily fit into the same um, faith category, let's say. Um, but how much, like, how do you get there if you can't die to, to, to those things? Like, well, how so, do you get there if you can't die? To Sorry. I just want to, build off what you just said, Sherry, but also what Matt just said. It's so one thing that I it's call this an intuition. It's deep within me that whatever the faiths are doing currently, whether you're CRC, Catholic, Orthodox, whatever it is. Now, Orthodox may like PVK says having its day in the center, but but I sense deeply that what they're doing, it's not working. It's not like we are we are not gathering 
the lost sheep. It's not, it's not working. The, the traditional, you know, and what, what I have seen in this space is the single best draw that I have seen anywhere for people genuinely thirsty for proper relationship, proper communion. Um, and I'm, I, I don't think it does anything to take away from the Eucharist or the liturgy or this. And it, it's, it's related to this, this, uh, this question of like, what is the church? And is the church a building and instantiations and processes? Or is the church the people? And, and when I say the people, is it the connections and the relationships between the people? Um, and so on one hand, it's like, I had this conversation with Chad and I, I don't mind if this gets me in trouble what I'm about to say, but like, do I care more that someone becomes a Christian than a Catholic? Yes. Do I care more that someone is saved from their alcoholism than becomes a Christian? Probably. Yes. Um, now those are intuitions in my head, but it's, it's like giving up my conception of the perfect or for, for this. And, and so in some ways I'm the ultimate boomer, right? Because I'm, I'm saying like, I, I don't have the answer that like, it's like a non-judgment. Like I don't, but like, I don't have the answer <laughs> and I'm genuinely thirsty to help people. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm thirsty to do that because I've been helped by this space immensely by this space. And so like within reading, writing the book, this last thing I'll say, re reading, writing the big book, you, you had this sense within that, that first formation of the first 40 to get sober. So they're like, we have this absolute duty, this responsibility to bring this to the world because like how many are, are dying, like literally dying right now because they don't have proper fellowship, proper communion, proper, you know, and like, so we have to bring this to as many people as fast as possible, as long as possible. And then they're so eager to get funding from John D. Rockefeller. And they get this meeting with John D. Rockefeller. And it's like, this is a billionaire. He could write us to the moon. And John D. Rockefeller's like, if I throw money at this thing, it's probably going to fuck it up. So I'm not going to do it. He didn't say that, but that that's what, what he said. And that was the single best move of a philanthropist <laughs> that he probably ever did as a philanthropist. <laughs> that he didn't write the check to AA. <laughs> it saved AA and countless millions of alcoholics. So like if the single best move of someone who does good with money was to not use the money, <laughs> you know, like that's God writing things in unexpected and poetic and incredible ways. And so like, I see this space and I see the goodness and I see that people that are helped from this space, myself included. And part of me is like, yeah, let's go. Let's go. And part of me is like, you know, you don't know what this is. Could be gone five years. Trust the spirit. Trust like, ah, so and end the Neil spiel. I think what's um, coming up for me right now. I don't know. Oh, go ahead. On my end. I, whoa. No, is it? I, I don't. On my end, I keep kind of cutting in and out. Is that what's happening? Am I lagging? I don't know. I haven't Fred's experienced got me that. Or something. I haven't experienced that. Okay. Except Sherry All did right. just cut out uh, for a second. Somebody, Okay, so it wasn't just me. All right, good, good, good. Okay, so as it relates to what Neil has said, I'm going to reveal something, and, and I love my church, and um, and I, I do. I love my pastor very much, and um, if you see this, pastor, um, know that this is this is all for um, uh, to to for educational purposes. Okay, so it was a different chat, and he knows the the conversation. The conversation that we had. Um, so what what ended up happening was is I had I went to um, I I introduced him to this estuary thing. Um, I sat with him and played one of the early not estuary shows. I said I'd really love to do an est not est or I'd love to do an estuary group on the ground. I'd like to do it in the town closest to us. You know, do it off off church site. I love I'd love to do it in that town because that town is um, suffering many different issues. And that town has it has a seminary in it, it has 10 Christian private schools, and their actual um, their actual public school 
is like one of the worst in the country as far as ratings of like they're just they have a lot of difficulties and i think one of the problems is is because the foundations in that town have been eroded and a lot of that is due to the the reputation that the church has given itself over the past several decades so i i got in touch with with him and we started putting together this plan of putting on the ground estuary and um he got the place set up i said hey do you mind if i uh, make a uh, a flyer for this he said no it's cool we'll do the have the front office put the flyer together i said okay i was immediately like i don't know i don't want the front office making that flyer but i want to make the flyer so then he says hey can you um say a little bit about this at the council meeting i said absolutely i'd love to say i'd love to tell the council meeting that uh of what estuary is so i get to the council meeting and at the council meeting they um on the sheet of paper it said faith and fellowship meeting and my pastor asked me would you share on that a little bit i said i don't know what that is i don't know what faith and fellowship meeting is um and he's like, oh, okay, so here's, and then he starts to lay it out. And I, and then, and, and then I gave him a little bit. I said, it's, this is what it is, or whatever. When I went to go to bed um, after that council meeting <clears throat> uh, that night, this only happened uh, Thursday night. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. Cause, and I told Anne, I said, I'm, I said, I can't sleep. She says, why? I said, cause I'm not interested in having another parachurch group. I'm not interested in having a faith and fellowship meeting. I'm not interested in doing another church meeting. That's not, that's all great that people want to do that. But in this very strange way, like I love the church so much that I do not want the church in the estuary meeting as the church. Because I think we have done such a terrible and abysmal job at dying to ourselves and, and trying to be, representative rep, representatives of christ that we have destroyed the church and um in a lot of ways not entirely and, and if i'm offending you i'm really sorry i'm not trying to, i'm trying to tell you i'm trying to tell you I'm, I'm also speaking from the point of view of the man who was not a christian only three years ago um, a man who every time he heard the word christ or savior had to leave the room because of his own selfish and self-centered issues and perceptions and people have worked really hard at at loving me and show me no this is what christ is and um i told pastor i said i called him the next day <laughs> i said i said we gotta talk man uh and i told him everything i just told you guys i said i'm not interested in in having some parachurch discussion group at a coffee shop that's off-site. I, I, I want to be able to say fuck and shit and tell people that I think they're full of shit at the meeting. I want to be able to talk about, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln in 1840 or, or 1850. I want to be able to talk about shit that has nothing to do with the fucking church, right? But I want to be able to, to um, still in some way try and be loving for the person i said it's not for the people who are in the pews already it's not it's not for them um and so it was a really good conversation and i'm just i'm speaking to this because of kind of what neil said like the rockefeller john d rockefeller didn't give him the money because it started to screw this up and i don't want to make this uh a like so that's my beef with with this kind of um if, if you're looking to start an estuary group, if you if it were me, I would say pay attention to the people that are trying to start it with you. Like you have to be, I have to be very clear with 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 the leadership here. Like this is not, this is not your, it's not it's not your feel good meeting that you that where everybody agrees with everything that you say. So, anyways, Pat, yeah. sorry, Th this Make a long ramble there. Holy no, shit, that was um, uh, awesome. <laughs> um i yeah i was eating that up um it's also i think interesting to me to realize that like this is not estuary as well 
that like um and i think this does tie into like the ecumenicism point and the spirit point in a little bit because it may be even clara's point which is that there's an element of profilicity at work here or at least a relation to profilicity in the sense that all of us here have watched each other on youtube enough to have a very good idea of each other's personalities and what's important to one another and what might be offensive to the other and and the some pain and and life history and and i know you know a few things about all of you and you guys all know things about me that if it would just be like a snap of the finger and we're all in tears kind of a thing um and so i think that there is a but there is still a real sense that this is different than offline and in real life uh back to me and neil's fomo like there that that there was kind of something that you uh five experienced uh in washington that was rather than it rather rather than it showing the online stuff to be fake it seemed to have shown you all that it was real but that even it took being in real life to kind of know that or something um and then the stuff you were saying chad also made me think back about um like family dynamics and being on the inside of something versus being on the outside of something um, and how churches, families, parachurch organizations, uh, online communities, there is this real sense of like the way that it feels on the inside versus the way it feels on the outside. Um, and right now I personally have like a very weird view about the church because I always thought of the church as the people. And I grew up going to a Christian private school that was very ecumenical. Um, and I remember really not understanding the Catholics to the point of distaste um, to where if, if I, I would, people would invite me to the part to parties and I would ask if the all boys Catholic school kids were going to be there. And if they were, I would not going to that party because I just, I thought, I thought of them as hypocrites that they drank and cuss and all this stuff. Um, which that's that's neither here nor there. That was just my uh, weird, uh, you know, prejudices as a high school kid. But um, but now, yes, um, what I was pointing to was for me in my life right now, this community is my connection to the body of Christ, to the church. And it's very strange because it includes Jewish people and sociologists and, you know, other people who are not connected to the church other than i mean even sherry you are a part of the orthodox church in good standing and, and praise be to god for that but like you're out in the middle of nowhere you know your church is is the world is creation i've and got so, a big cathedral <laughs> yeah a, a giant cathedral um and so yeah there is a real sense of um that this is a real thing but then i also i think that neil is right that we this is like a very cutting edge thing too and not just the online but also estuary there's a sense in which estuary is just like a roll your eyes small group like jacob said a small group without the bible you know it's it's literally just a bible study without the bible um but also to chad's point like try it try try the protocol and see if it doesn't spark something um but uh, also i've got no experience with real life estuary or irl non-online estuary uh not not mm -hmm. estuary so i would be interested in in like the connections of that as it pertains to ecumenicism in three-dimensional space where you can touch smell here and then the other question would be you guys kind of did the like deep dive plunge intensity 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 for a short period of time and I imagine that if you were meeting with the same people for, a, you know, months to years, it gets less ecumenical in a way because it just becomes its own community. But then you also then start having to deal with all of the faults and flaws and hurts of a of a family. Uh, you know, OK, that, that, that was my pent up thoughts. I have to I I have a lot of things I want to say, but I actually would like to hear from Clara and, and Alan.
I, I have a lot, quite a lot of thoughts. I've really enjoyed sort of, it, it's taking me some time to percolate. But um, Chad, I, I wanted to say, um, wow, it is hard to stand up to a pastor, especially, I mean, that that's hard, that's a hard thing. And so I was, I was listening to you and I was just kind of like, that's hard. Um, and especially, um, you're looking out for, for other folks who, who maybe are outside. Um, and so that's something I've been thinking about is, is, is who's on the inside, who's on the outside, um, who's included in this, this ecumen ecumenicism, um, which, which I know Sherry, Sherry was kind of saying ecumenicism, well, well that, that really stands the risk of kind of watering everything down. And then I, I sort of thinking with that, um, yeah, who's there? Who's what? What's the role? What's the role of someone like Tigrock? What's the role of someone like like Jacob? What's the role? So that's kind of where, where my brain's been at, and, and I felt like Chad, you almost anticipated that sort of question. Um, so I don't know. And Mick Mo, I'm I'm still processing everything you said. So sorry. Um. Uh, yeah, um, I've just been processing and thinking as well. And, uh, but I, I, I think it's unfortunate cause I, uh, Luke has a great quote about like, we, you know, that I, you know, it's like, I barely comprehend it myself and I have no ability to make you comprehend it. And I think that Mm -hmm. The gaps that we sometimes see, we think they are so bridgeable and we realize that we have no language to bridge those gaps. Uh, and it takes a real spirit of humility to, um, to actually make an attempt at having relationship with someone outside of your identity groups. And it's not easy. And I think that a lot of churches own... Like, I think that, that that wisdom should be there in a lot of churches, but a lot of churches have been drained of, like, resources and thought and vi vibrancy, and they're sort of this glorified old folks' home, something for old people to do on weekends. Uh, I think they're a little drained of courage, Ellen. What do you think of that? Is yeah. Courage, so, I, I want to talk about that. But it's also because that's, like, they're just clinging. I mean, they've gone from, I mean, if you watch, if you went to a prep, a Protestant church in the 1950s, you fast forwarded 74 years later, it'd be like, you know, it'd go from like, oh, all the smartest people are here and everyone in the town either goes to the Anglican or the Presbyterian, blah, 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 Baptist church. Um, and then those would be all the smartest, most talented. And now fast forward and you have someone who as a pastor is not making a ton of money. The only people who regularly attend and tithe are probably the older people. They only want to talk about certain subject matters. Um, so we are sort of in the woods, um, mm. but but the good thing about being in the wilderness uh, is that that is the outer courtyard where you can actually meet and commune with other people. It's not the Holy of Holies for, for a reason. So, I mean, the church thing, I think there are a lot of reasons there and a lot of, you know, questions, but I just want to focus in on like having that courage to actually have relationship with someone and act if whether you do it in the church or you do it, you know, we're, we're doing it guerrilla style. We're doing it individually. Random people are choosing to have uh, estuaries and try and commune with groups of people. But I think that that courage to actually try and bridge a gap is really what we're talking about. But you know, that mm -hmm. building a language for understanding when right now we have no language for understanding. So I just have a but, couple no, of things. Just to, that's beautiful. And just to... Oops. Go ahead, Chad. <laughs> well, just to address real quick, I, I uh, Clara and 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 and, and Alan. Um, so Clara, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't have viewed it. I wouldn't have said that there was a standing up. It was just uh It was a. Uh, it was very hard, and I just. I told him, this is how I'm honestly feeling. I need to talk with you about this because I couldn't sleep last night. And yeah, yeah I think you really respected it. And, and so we're going to try the estuary. Mm -hmm. And um, to, to Alan's point and about, and Sherry's about the courage, I think it's, and, and then um, Neil's idea about, you know, there was sincerity culture and then authenticity culture. And, and then there's this third way. And I think the third way is a weaving in and out of the two of them. 
Um, you have to know, you, you, like, there's a time to be authentic, and it's probably not often. Um, and then there's a time, uh, probably more often, to be sin sincere. And and I think all this is is basically can be boiled down to, am I willing to um, to humble myself uh, to to something? Uh, some higher principle, I suppose. I think that's where the courage comes from. Um, and so I wouldn't say what I did was courageous. Please don't misunderstand that. I just, like, I, I just was unwilling to do the same thing that I've always seen. Or, or I, and so that's all. So, all right, pass. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things. First of all, what was coming to my mind listening was, first of all, I'm not worried about what is the TLC. That's kind of not the question when I am when I kind of laid that ecumenicism on the table. Um, and, and then what else came up for me was Claire's question. What do I do with this elation, right? What do I do with this, this feeling? And, and, you know, to name it, it's really love. Right. Like you just that's what it is, Clara, just so you know, <laughs> when you leave those gatherings with people, you have you feel love. And I've just I've been getting feedback, individual feedback and feedback on the discord server. And people have been DMing me about just the amount of love that they feel, but not that they felt love but that they love everything around them. So like suddenly the world has changed for them, right? Like they go to this place, they experience this kind of love, they leave and they love everyone. You know, like Graham and Corey and Joy were sitting in the airport looking at all the groups of people in the airport and going, those are estuaries. And falling in love with the people in the groups in the airport. People they didn't know. But knowing how beautiful people are because they had been involved in that kind of communion. And so when they were telling their stories, and I've been hearing stories from others. I mean, I heard a story last night from somebody who basically had his first communion with, a, with an animal. Like just felt so much love, the thing walked up to him and sat in his lap. And he was blown away, right? Like this just has never happened to him before. Was and that Alan with a subway rat? No. <laughs> no, but what I'm so what I'm what I'm reminded of is George McDonald's story, The Castle. And I know Neil knows it because he jumped in with us on that one. But at some point in that story, they all start cooperating with each other, the brothers and sisters, okay? They start cooperating and suddenly they turn to each other and say, why you are my brother, why you are my sister. And then George McDonald has this line underneath, yet they knew it all along, right? So it's like suddenly they have this realization that they are a family but it was something that they always knew. They knew they were a family, but it wasn't realized. It wasn't recognized, right, Matthew? So it's like when you leave something like the conference that we had, I'm going to try to answer Clara's question, and you have this elation and you're experience the, experiencing this kind of sensed unity with and I'm, I'm going to say all of the cosmos, you know, like everything, everything just suddenly takes on. That's called an enchanted world. OK, that's what that is. And and you can keep that. You can keep it by practicing that presence in your life, because I believe that that is the Holy Spirit. Right. And 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 um, but. But I have heard from others that there were lines crossed, religious lines crossed in the conference that made them very uncomfortable because it looks like ecumenicism. 
And I love these people. I respect these people. And I, and I understand their discomfort because I've been there. I've been there. Right. And, but that's where the courage well, comes in. Right. Sherry. Right. But what so you're talking here's about. The thing, here's the thing, Neil, and I'm just going to say this flat out. Okay. To draw a line is not Christian. And what do we do with that, folks? I'm an Orthodox Christian. Lines have been drawn, okay? <laughs> like big, deep ones, you know, for thousands of years. Whoop! So that's what I'm talking about. So I, I think what unites all of us in this space, in, in this virtual space, also also with the uh, estuary conferences, but, but from this space is voluntary vulnerability. What we all share in common on this screen right now is we are voluntarily entering into vulnerability with each other and with the broader community and the internet. Like we're all taking a leap of faith that putting ourselves out here in some way, shape or form is for the good. And we're doing that leap of faith by being voluntarily vulnerable, which is very hard uh, for, for some people to do. But I, I wanna talk about courage in relation to von voluntary vulnerability. Because I had this, um, my church is in the process of closing right now. It's merging with, uh, with another church. And one thing I, I worry about a lot is that the prevailing mindset is we have to preserve what we have. We have to keep what we have. And it's in that mindset that, that that's actually the the death mindset it's death um now this this occurred to me i'm i'm, I'm going to throw out something weird uh here but bear with me this occurred to me in relation to the matthew peugeot video that dropped uh related to the holding pattern when he talks about the holding pattern he talks about being stuck and it occurred to me that when all of us, I think all of us in some regard have been in that situation at some point in our life where we, where we feel stuck. And when that, when that happens, the transformation that occurs is not through space. It's not, you're moving somewhere. The transformation is for the agent. It's for the, it's for the person. And to tie this back to vulnerability. So I would regard vulnerability as the foundation for any relationship, any relationship. So if I, so here's the difference between a friendship and a colleague and a colleague. Like if I have a colleague, it's like, oh, we might exchange some information that's useful, but we're not changed by each other. But if I have a friend, that friend actually is changing me and I'm changing that friend. Like what I say matters because I have the ability to really impact or change that, that other, um, so that, that vulnerability, that willingness to be vulnerable is actually the center of friendship. Because if to, to not be vulnerable means like the hardening of the heart, it means you, you cannot be changed. It means that you are sufficient that, you know, and uh, I, I think, I think it's the key to, to all of this, this voluntary, it's like what, what we all found in this space is we entered into the space. We took a vulnerable leap of faith in some way, shape or form. And we were rewarded for that voluntary leap of faith. We were, were rewarded for that in relationships and connections and community and love. And, um, and I don't, I, 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 I see that courage as essential for, for that leap of faith. And anyway, I, I, I don't know how to instill that sense of courage or I don't know how to encourage. Something that's coming up for me, and it is a little vulnerable. It's part of a dream that I told Sherry about because she was in the dream. Um, Sherry is the is it? Sherry is a dream. Sherry is just a dream. <laughs> um, uh, but basically, a part of the dream was I was uh, basically a part of some lost boys in the forest, and some of us got sick, but there was a lot of us, and we needed to go basically to the back to civilization in order to get taken care of. But in the dream, I knew that if we all went back as a big group of people, that they would think we were like an army coming to attack. And so we had to spread out and basically come back staggered and almost one by one so that they knew that we weren't kind of 
And obviously, if you're visualizing that, that's just a spread out army. But <laughs> in the dream, it works because it's not a big one creature, like gray mass, like Sherry was talking about earlier. It's all of us kind of quilted out and and taken in where we need to be taken in. Um, and then I do think that that kind of courageous vulnerability is where the humor comes in. And specifically because, and I, I thought it actually be actually about making this one of the topics I talked about, but I also watched a brain rot short that accused um, people who are funny of basically being fake and ha like performing that if you're a funny person, that's actually like a vulnerability shut off. Uh, and you can use that as a tool to kind of push people away and say, I'm not going to give you my vulnerable self. I'm just going to make you giggle. Um, but once again, this is like a, a general and particular problem because um, God also has a sense of humor, right? Like that's a, that's kind of totally. cliche, but it's one of those cliches that just is continually, re you know, renewing. Um, yeah, I think that's all I had to say. <laughs> I'm also noticing that I want everyone to keep talking like forever. And then I also want to talk. Well, here's the question. If we want to make it like Chad, Neil, Alan, Matthew, I don't know. Matthew, you're not going to church, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh you are. Okay. He's a Roman Catholic, just, just like I am. So Clara and McMull are church, church last, pastor last, priest last at the moment. So for the those true who, ecumenicists. Who, yeah. For those who have pastors and priests, what would you do if your priest told you you should no longer be part of this little corner because Ooh. it is a form of ecumenicism? Good, good question. Not even a, not, it, it wouldn't even be a, I'm just going to say it, it wouldn't, for me, um, it wouldn't even be a question. I'd be like, let me talk to Anne. Protestants. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know what I would do in that situation. It's, it's a trolley Anne problem. Said, if Anne said it's a trolley problem. No, it's a trolley it, no. problem because I I don't. I think like I'm going to be in McMo's camp over here. <laughs> I have a feeling. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. I, I would listening. ask for me. For me, it would be. It would be. My first instinct would be like, well, just got to find a new church. Yeah, my second, my first action would be uh, let's talk with Anne about it, and then if Anne said, um, "Yeah, no, that's kind of ridiculous," we could we should we could leave. Then I think we would leave. But if Anne said, "No, we, we're going to stay here," then I would not be very happy with her initially, but I would honor what she said. So mm -hmm. that's who it would boil down to for me. Your wife. Sorry. Just... Yeah, and I would, I, and I'm probably, I mean, not probably. I'm definitely a goober when it comes to this stuff. Um, you know, I'm cradle to grave uh, Catholic, but I've I've said if if I found a, a certain a certain situation and a certain woman, and and she kind of stuck me with a, a similar question, I'm like, hey man, you're not, we're not good, we're not raising this family Catholic or or, or blah blah blah. We're not going to continue Catholic. I, I think I would probably have to uh, acquiesce, but okay, my, wait, I'm sensing a I'm sensing an Adam and Eve situation here. You're going to blame it on the women. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, that, well, that was kind of a tangent. But my question, <laughs> where my brain goes, is I I, oh, I just got because of chance. Right? Okay, okay, okay. But I'm single, so that, it doesn't even matter. But um, yeah. So why are you talking about a girl? <laughs> well, because I'm trying to put my head in. A, in he's a talking about a girl because he's single. <laughs> Ladies, no. Uh, so I was trying to put my my I was trying to put out there an analogous kind of thought uh, <laughs> experiment I've, I've put myself into before. But this is where my brain went: is I would want to, in, in kind of a Chad way, I would want to stand up and question the priest and say, "What is? Can you tell me what's wrong with ecumenicism?" And I know that's kind of breaking the thought experiment, and I hate when people do that. Uh, so excuse me. That's but not. It's, it's, that's not. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a true, honest answer from you. Yeah, well, that's, th that's what I would do. I would, I would want to have a discussion with the priest on what his, what, what is it, why, what, and why are is his perspective that well, I, I can't participate participate in an ecumenical group that for overall seems pretty all good, uh, uh, you know, 
all things considered. Mm -hmm. I yeah, kind of so experienced this. Um, I was I was forced, not with specifically ecumenicism, but with basically practicing community in a way that was not seen as okay by my elders. Um, and it's ultimately what led to me getting fired. But I also submitted to my elders. So I basically quit TLC. And, and uh, in, in this scenario, I, it would be like, you know, quitting estuary and then still getting booted from your church. So I only wish that I had, instead of making the decision out of fear and what the right thing to do was, I wish I would have spent more time slowing down and listening to my conscience and trusting what I knew to be right. Um, even if it meant going against the elders. Um, but easier said than done. Good gracious. Yes. I recommend not getting in that situation to begin with. Well, for me, it would be the equivalent of being told that I can't go to AA anymore. It, it almost wouldn't even be a question <laughs> because like the idea is, um, it's like one of the questions I wrote in here. Do any of you sense that your life depends on the care that you give? Mm -hmm. And that's what this is to me. This isn't like social hour for me. I really enjoy you guys a lot and I love mm -hmm. you a lot, but this isn't about the information that we share. Mm -hmm. This isn't about the, you know, it's, it's, there's, there is a fellowship and it's not even about the, 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 the seven of us that are on the screen for me. It's about the the person that might stumble over this video and think, what are they talking about? I want what they have. That's what this is about. It's not about it's not about us. So if if it came down to, boy, I don't think that it'd be really you know wise of you to be in that uh, TLC anymore or go to AA anymore, I'd just be like, guess I got to find a new church. Well, that's why I, Chad. That's why I said this is the feeling that people experience at the conference the elation that they have when they leave is love it's the only thing that will elate you it's the only thing that will make you that will put a skip in your step you know so if god is love then like that's I why I said, that's why i said like and, and I'm, these are honest questions because I'm actually I'm actually in, in some yeah. kind of a conversation about this, and, and so it's really Hard. difficult for me to discern. And, I, I and and so it's like, well, wait though, but but loving my neighbor and loving my enemy—that's my duty as a Christian. So why am I? why am I suddenly getting the sense that I have to stay within or one should, it's not personal to me. One should stay within the bounds of something because I like, I just can't find a higher calling than loving people. Like Chad said, there is that that it, for me it's there's nothing greater than that. And this gets to Neil's thing of laying down your life. So, do I have to lay down my life just to a confession? Mm, I don't know. Yeah, I I do want to hear what Neil and Alan have to say because I think that both of them just temperamentally are less likely to um <laughs> jump off a bridge yeah <laughs> but <laughs> yeah exactly uh but also like you know we are not going to beat the cult allegation the the cult allegations if every single one of us is like yeah if a pastor told me not to do it i'm yeah, screw the pastor i'm going with the weird internet friends well you yeah know, and like, i'm really glad that we're not all doing that yeah actually. yeah i'm super glad See, I, I, I answered, I don't know, and this is, I, I called it a trolley problem because a lot of it comes down to the circumstances and the situation. And I, I don't know what my conscience would say in that situation. I genuinely don't know. Like every everyone left brains, like 
the the whole the whole problem with the trolley problem uh, is the Sam Harris way of thinking. It's like, yes, of course, I will act exactly as I can envision it now. I will act in that situation of extreme pressure and duress, and I will act exactly as I calculated. And every calculation is, and it's not it's not the way it works. I don't know what my conscience will say in the moment. I don't know the specific reasons. I don't know. I I don't know what God will ask me to give up to give up everything and follow. I don't know. Um, and so I, I was just in Eucharistic adoration yesterday and I went through four different aspects of my life where I consider these four aspects like absolutely paramount or not paramount, but like really important aspects to my life. And it's like, what would it mean if, if I had to give that up? Um, I saw it. Yeah, th no, that that's, that's death. That, mm -hmm. that is, uh, you know, the contemplating, contemplating death. One thing I've been thinking about lately, please do not take this the wrong way. Please do not take this the wrong way, what I'm about to say. But someone who's nearing the end of their life, reflecting on their, their, their life, like what are, what are they thinking about? What are they mm -hmm. caring about? What do they have gratitude for? Um, and I was, as I was in Eucharistic adoration, and I'm I'm not thinking I'm nearing the end of my life, but I had this, I had this uh, like reflection, and I was thinking about various aspects of my life, and and I was like, you know what, I did my best, like I I really, I really gave it my all, you know, and whatever let the let the chips fall where they may, and I I I did I did my best, and did I mess up a tons loads, did oh, I yeah. do my best. Yeah. Sure. And and so I sort of feel that way about the situation you're you're outlining and um what does it mean to die to self? Um so so the let's say Jesus to the rich young ruler who's a devout Jew and he's he's certain about his faith and Christ says, Well, all you need to do is give up everything um and follow me. It's like I, I understand that guy completely. Like, you know, he thinks he's doing right. Uh and so like Am I different than that guy? I I don't know. Like I I, I don't know. I genuinely like we Yeah, but pray give up you are, pray you are not put to the test. Like give is up that everything. Give up yeah. you, is that give up the Eucharist and go live in the wilderness? <laughs> or is that give up your friends that you love? Like there's so a lot of mo choices to be made there, right? Like this is the thing. Yeah. Um, 99 and... point Yeah, I'll, I'll just say 99.9% .9 of the time that giving up the thing that's a part of the tradition is if you think you need to give that up, that's part of the tradition, it's probably pride 99.9% .9 of the time. Like I'm special. I'm the one who gives that up. But I, I, I refuse to say God is trapped by one paradigm, by one way of thinking, by one this. And because I, and this is, this is actually my issue with um, Sam Tiedemann and, and the Trinity. I'll just throw, I like, I've, I've, I've tried that conversation with Chan, the chat, uh, Sam for, Chan, San, Sam, Sam for like eight months, and you know because he within the corner he he is you know very much um, he he understands the truth that's unveiled through evolution, and and I my response to Sam would be something like, what do you think the Holy Spirit has been doing these seventeen hundred years since Aquinas? Like e even if you know, so, so anyway, Sam's not here, I, I, Neil. I, okay, yeah, Neil, no. wait. But, okay, but, I, sorry. I wanna... sorry. <laughs> I don't want to talk about the Trinity. Augustine. Yeah. But no, no, no. I, I, I want to bring up. <laughs> He's not, I want to bring Sam up, doesn't watch this anyway. <laughs> I want to bring up a uh, an example from um, Franz Jägerstetter. What's that movie? Terrence Malick's movie. Um, a Hidden Life. Hidden Life. His priest told him to sign on the dotted line in that movie. Exactly. That's my point. Okay. And And he did not. And of course, like, look, I, you know, went through the book of Job. I, you know, I've talked a lot about integrity and holding on to your integrity. Job is the perfect image of this story of, of somebody who has to choose outside of the status quo, right? Where everybody is saying, no, 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 that's not how we play this game. These are the rules. You need to follow the rules. You're talking crazy talk now, right? And it's Job that mediates them to the next level 
in the end. Okay. I got all this stuff going through my head while I'm asking these questions and I'm sorry to make this so personal, but it's just seriously been on my mind. It's, it's the and, difference between a monk and a mystic, right? Like not all monks are mystics and it, and it is specifically making me think of Thomas Merton who for a long part of his life basically begged to be able to be a hermit. And I have a feeling that a lot of that was because he just kind of got tired of having to be obedient so, because yeah. if you've, if if you've chosen the life of submission to the church, the godly thing to do is to obey. Right. And most people's lives are not like jam packed unless you're an absurdist like me. It's it, they're not jammed packed with uh, God coming to Abraham and off and asking him to offer his son. Um, and even Christ's life, there were moments when his hour had not yet come. Right. And so there is a I think there is a real sense that like. Yeah, it. I'm also thinking about Cal, who talked about I think he kind of talked about this a couple of weeks ago on a stream. I just feel like every time he pops on, it's like it feeds me for a month, you know, um, Cal. Yeah. Yeah. Cal. Oh, Ritter. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and. I can't exactly remember how it connected to what you were saying, Sherry, um, other than to say that there's there's also a sense of <sighs> that God both wants to give us the desires of our hearts and to teach us patience. Mm -hmm. And in order to do both of those things, <laughs> uh, it really puts us in a bind in terms of um not striking the rock and, and to get the water out right like, is, is it the desires of our hearts or is it what is our hearts the, 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 well i i <laughs> you know the, there's there's what god knows can be and there's what we know can be and I trust the former way, way more than I trust the latter. But yeah, does, so does that mean one can, does that mean we're all Protestants, right? Does that Wait, mean that? Can we hear from Alan? Sorry, sorry. sorry. Alan, Alan, you unmuted. So I just want to hear what your words are. <laughs> no, I, in my mind, I mean, I don't really know how I'd react in that situation. And I'd certainly want to have a conversation with my pastor. But I just don't want us to forget about the love of being faithful of like, I hope that like, if I did leave the corner and did do it because my pastor told it like that, it would be like, you would see that, that even that as a loving thing for the corner that like, okay. you would see me okay. as obedient to like a spiritual authority. And that even that would be a gift. And like, I mean, you brought up a hidden life, which is like, the, my favorite movie of all time by a country mile and like he it, you know he's in jail for not serving in the german military during world war ii and even his family doesn't understand why mm -hmm. he's doing that and they right. like blame each other and infight and everybody resents him and he, they're like right. why are you why are you choosing to do this and it's obviously out of love. And that's the beautiful thing is they see it as an act of love of even, you know, even all of the suffering is in love. So like, but I just actually, don't want to. Sorry, Alan, but they, they actually saw that as selfish on his part because he was neglecting his wife and children. And yeah, no. Yeah. And that, that's why, that's why like it's yeah. But in the same way, like, people might say, Oh, Alan, like he's a, he's a coward. He doesn't want to, you know, he kowtowed to his pastor and, you know, he should just leave the church, you know, but I hope people would see like, no, it's out of love. And like, I'm trying to my, I'm trying my best to mirror what it means to love truly by staying, by respecting the authority. Like we talked right. about earlier, like what would, I mean, if we just were in communion with each other, there'd also have to be real rules. So like following the rules is not always the unloving thing to do. I I think maybe yeah. this is, sure, best, I, I think this is maybe best exemplified by the idea of you got to do this to get into heaven. I can't stand that idea. I can't stand it. 
Only uh, the universalists are saved. <laughs> well, I will say what I would say to that is God decides. It's up to God. It's Upwards, not up to me. But you, yeah. The, the reason and, why you hate people who say mm -hmm. uh, you must do this to be saved is how I came up with the joke, only the universalists are saved. Because it's as if you're saying the one thing you have to do to be saved is think that everyone's saved. <laughs> I can't believe I had to explain that to you, Neil. Come on, man. Sorry, Matthew, I, I wasn't I wasn't currently on the humor topic, but I get it now. See a little bit uh and it might be just kind of uh not profound or anything, but I'm I'm seeing a little bit of the the rub of the law between the spirit of the law. And so the <laughs> The institution, the constraints, the the arenic forces that that are, are are you know that come down upon us that constrain and afford, they they should serve the spirit, right? They should they should uh, that because I guess um you know and now I guess we can kind of to some degree shake the, the the thought experiment. Let's let's break out a little bit because I would say. In, in my conversation, I, I, I would interrogate and I would, first of all, I'd ask him why, where is he coming from? Then I would try to explain to him what I'm doing and, and what this little community is doing. And I would, I would, I would hope to, that I could, uh, I would hope that I could prove my point that this is overall optimizing and helping my well-being and my, my spirit flourish. And that if, if there's some kind of strict or doctrinal or, or you know, rigorous frame or template that he's trying to apply at the expense of my well-being, at the expense of my spirit, then I, I, I would find a flaw in that. And this comes to, I guess, to bring it a little bit back to Alan's kind of original framing of the the arenic spirit. And I and I, I, I kind of saw the, the 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 synthesis early with, you know, that you we are these agents dynamically coupled. We we are the beaver that participates in the river. If you go to the library full of antifas and it's all of us and we embody it to to the fullest extent at the at a certain number of you know a quantity then we would break a threshold and i think we could alter that arena spirit we can we can make the 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 college library uh uh a more i want to be gentle a, a less a less uh extremist uh, uh situation um i'm sure you might be but there won't be nobody in the college library I, I missed that. Say it again, Claire. Someone's I, I mic's firing turn, off. Is that me? Yeah, you might need to turn up your mic, Claire. I'll take it off here. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to assure you, Matthew, and this won't be funny after all this, that there was actually nobody in the college library um, at all. So that's for sure. Well, and, and, I, and I want to tie this, I also want to kind of tag in your, your question, too, which I thought Sherry did a great, great part of this. And you know, this has been kind of my, uh, this has been kind of my, uh, my, my take, I'm sorry, but, but side that for a second. <laughs> this has been my take on the whole is, is TLC real, it, uh, you know, question is, is it, it never made sense to me. If, 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 you know, you understand, you know, the Ian McGilchrist and Jonathan Peugeot notion of, of attention and, and how tightly coupled that is to reality. It's like, I'm bathing my attention into this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm embodying in, in whatever hybrid and, and mutated way, this, this digital space, it, 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 it just, to me, it's on its face is going to affect how you, I, I guess what I'm trying to say, Claire, is I think you would have to go out of your way to go experience TLC, go experience Northwest Jury. Hopefully you're like Chad and you've experienced three of these things. And then to like, not have that, positively or or you know i don't even want to put the positive thing on it to not have that uh reflect or influence for for what it is onto you and and, and thus into your reality it's it you know and 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 i had i had a big hang hangover with it too uh or I, I was definitely expecting it and, and i, I was kind of like you know i'm a big extrovert maybe i'll bounce back quicker blah blah, blah. I, I don't know I, i've never experienced something like that but i drove someone to the airport Mark, shout out marcus shara and he hit me with exactly what Sherry said. He said, now we go back to loving on the internet. It's, it doesn't end. We go back to doing our, our regular ritual. You know, we had kind of a, a holiday 
type uh, event. And now we go back to this and, and here I am, you know, uh, literally a week later and I'm doing uh, one of my favorite things, having deep conversations with just the most beautiful and kind and caring people and thoughtful people. And I can't wait to the next holiday. And I'm going to remind Neil to not miss it. Um, it's, it's, I kicked myself in the butt for two years over, over one. And so I, I made sure that I was going to this one. And so, so yeah, I just, I just would say that is, is the, and I can actually kind of get into Mo too, because does the family that, ex, that expects the, the, the child to be a certain way, is that in service of the prophilicity, the optimization of that child? I would, you would like to think it's some platonic, here you go, it's a platonic form of the family. You would like to think that's happens, or maybe, or maybe that's a little bit of a cheap shot because that's still like this dynamic process, right? That's the spirit of relating that you want family to child, parent to child. And, and I would like to think that most decent parents are aiming for that. But there is also, I mean, it's the chaotic world and we're broken humans. And when you said that, Mo, I, you know, I, I remember my conversation with Chad, uh, my therapeutic talk with Chad. I had this, this fuck up complex. Like I had this, the little brother's going to fuck it up, get the little brother out of, excuse my language, the, you know, he's going to mess it up. And I, I, it, it was so therapeutic to get that out to, I, I went to a therapist one time uh, when I got in trouble in the military, my short stint in the military. And uh, I got that out and it stuck in my mind. And I repeated it with Chad because it, you know, I, I like to think I've shaken that and, and, you know, I've, I've outgrown that uh, to be so bold, but it, it, it was, it was this, this expectation, it was this family di dynamic, this this individuation that went wrong. This this individuation that really really went wrong. I don't know if any of that coheres. That's great. I think we can go on. Uh, there, I do want to say another thing, but I don't. I want to give others a chance to say anything. Like Clara. <clears throat> um, I'll just maybe just say real quick. Um, I was checking. Um, just just it's such an inversion to me sherry that question you asked about um and you know if your priest if your priest said you know don't 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 do this would you still do it and um because i'm coming sort of at this i, I feel like i'm breaking all the rules right to come here and to hang out yeah. with y'all from from the other perspective as someone who's who's like not religious and um so forth and so i feel like yeah i'm there i'm breaking all the rules you know i'm doing all the things that <laughs> good atheists would never do right um so so this is really intriguing and 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 i think yeah. also you have sort of alluded to this like like it, it is kind of moving uh, very moving and you do sort of feel the love um and see the love and um yeah yeah see things differently so so i don't know i i, I didn't really know exactly how to say that but there's, yeah, there's that's that's interesting that as an atheist you have a priest like you have a taboo, right? You have a line that shouldn't be crossed. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Like as a sociologist, but, Sarah, that must be book to think about. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I, it's I, sort I, of as a caricature of myself, a humorous caricature. We but, we yeah. think of we think of missionary work as uh, physical vulnerability. And I think we're entering a time of uh, vulnerable, uh, uh, emotional uh, vulnerability. And, um, you know, there, there are the types of people that tend to the flock, those that are within the herd. And there are the types of people that uh, want to bring others into the herd. And I define the herd as a better place. It's not a location. And uh, anyway, I, I want to be one of those that hope to bring others into the herd. So even family. if it's not my herd. Family, Neil. Herd, yep. herd bad. Family yeah. good. <laughs> Lost sheep of Israel. How about that? Well, okay. So yeah. I, I had it. I came to it. I came to a dis. Well, I came to an answer before I asked you guys this question. Uh, and it's not that I think I have the right answer. The it's, old Columbo tactic. I mean, no, I wanted to hear from all of you because I thought, is this the only way to deal with this problem? Or, you know, and you've all shown me 
in such a beautiful estuary way that the only answer for this question is that each person is on their own journey and they have to make their own decision and they have to follow their own conscience, whatever that might tell them to do. And, um, and I find that really interesting because uh, in this little corner, sometimes we get hung up on individualism. And yet we come to these kinds of crossroads where that has to be, we're not ism, we're not isming. We are particular human beings in a particular arena, as Matthew would say, and we have to make a particular choice in order to be in union with the one. So now we are forced to make a decision that may actually appear, I don't know, schismatic to some people. Um, and for me personally, that has given me a new insight into what that I'm not I'm not blessing schisming. Like I, I will never do that. But it has given me a different insight into um that. Because in order to preserve the uniqueness of every single person here, we all have to be part of something different. You know, like a lot of people have a lot of people have talked to me about you know, getting into an actual community, you know, oh, I'm going to gather these people around. We're going to have, and I just, I'm like, oh God, <laughs> that's a disaster. That That's a recipe for disaster. It takes very special people to be able to do that for over the long term. And I'm sure Claire's, you know, being a sociologist has st studied cults, right? And that's what they end up being. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to wrap up, wrap up my thoughts Chad, because it's getting long now, but um, that's that's kind of the conclusion I came to. And listening to everybody, that's it. Like that's all there is, folks. <laughs> which is my uh, which is my thing here. Look on my uh, see that that's all, folks. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Oh goodness. Oh goodness. Um yeah, I'll, I'll probably have to run here too. Um if you want to do closing thoughts. Did, or unless Alan, did you look like you wanted to say something? Yeah, I I I guess like well this honestly ties into your comment uh earlier, Clara, of like, well, even if theoretically like in your let's I know you're not like the only identifier is for you as atheist, but let's just take that as the identifier. Um, it's like, even if your atheist friend said, you, you know, you can't be part of this community anymore. It's bad for you. Like you must choose us or them. And like you chose them. Like I know, or like, I believe that like through your experiences in TLC, like you would be the mustard seed inside of that friend group like for good. And I'm not saying, Oh, you just tear down the walls and you change everything. I'm just saying like, you would be like that love that you were talking about from earlier, or like that experience you're talking about, from, like that will be with you. And like that will work in the group. And so it's not like, Oh, your atheist friends say you can't go to TLC anymore. And I would think like, you've turned your back, Clara, you were supposed to become orthodox. Like, how dare you? I would think like, she's working in the ways that she can in the places that she can. And yeah. like the spirit is with her. And like, that's why Christ says, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age, like wherever you go, whatever side of these decisions you come down on, like the hot, the spirit that guides you will be with you. And so you don't have to worry about like, Oh, do I choose the corner or do I choose my church or do choose my job or choose my wife? And it's just like the, the spirit is the thing that matters. And like, the thing you're experiencing and like that love as Sherry said, and like being like, you know, following that is what matters. So I wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me if you're like, Oh, I can't be part of the TLC anymore. Cause I know that, you know, I know that you're just following that spirit in the way that you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 
and this can be my final word or whatever, but um, I, I think you, that was incredibly said, Alan. And I think that it's also not just that you know those things about the spirit and Clara's participation, but just even that, you know, Clara, we know Clara now, you know, and so, or you guys know her better than me. I've only been interrogated by her once. So, uh, <laughs> you know, in real life is different, but, um, I think my final thought is just, um, how incredibly odd, strange and glorious it is that we have found a we and that there is an us and, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's it for me. <clears throat> that kind of a weird final uh, comment or order. Um, Claire, you're a, a sociologist. Are you familiar with Robert Putnam's uh, Bowling Alone? Yeah. Okay. I just I I, I find it one of the drums. I, I only have a few drums I beat around here, and that's definitely one of them. Uh, and uh, I just I th I think it would. I mean, it sounds like you said you're familiar. So I just I just think it. If you weren't, I would have definitely recommended it to try and throw some some context uh, into what the heck you see these weirdos trying to coalesce for <laughs> and uh and 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 i would hope you know i don't i don't know your communal or community or friend group or family dynamics but i i do know the culture and i i i'm i'm a people person and i've, I've been around and met a lot of people and i just hope you would understand or 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 can 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 realize that you you don't have to be sociologist Clara uh, in, in TLC. You can just be Clara. So. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful, and I, I really appreciate the warm welcome that TLCers and Peterson Sphere folks and Grail Country and oh my goodness, is this a virtual? sort of hug situation well, welcome to the virtual cult clara you're in you virtual a cult card or <laughs> say one yeah. the e-cult <laughs> you get a coupon for a big whopper or whatever they are yeah, yeah there's no open. there's no sex there's no money there's no power it's just a bunch of yeah. dorks talking yeah <laughs> <laughs> is this an induction ceremony or <clears throat> my my connection has been so wickedly stupid. I didn't hear anything that Sherry said. I can't wait to hear it on the playback. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> I um, hope so. Okay. Um. So before we go, bye, Matthew. I love you, man. Not in that uh, weird way either, but just like yeah, genuinely. Play way. Yeah, in the Play-Doh way. Let me let me form you, buddy. Play-Doh. Um, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, Clara, I am interested in what your takeaway was. Like your your question, what? How would you answer your own topic? I mean, I I've heard folks talk about. Um, starting estuaries getting this going um i want to i want to get to the bottom of this and, and uh, <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm an academic so obviously i'm gonna spend a long time thinking about what's happening here writing it up talking to folks um interviewing people um no but i was just really moved by the urgency and the not the urgency that's the wrong word but the there was just so much power in getting folks together, hearing them talk, seeing, just kind of seeing this sort of delight, people coming to delight in these conversations, but but not just the old conversations, also this this sort of spark of newness, um, the spark of something happening, um, which I guess Sherry called love. So, um, there's so much going on there, Chad. I don't know what to do with it, but but I think I think when you find something this cool, you got to hold on to it, and you have got to not just sit and watch it happen, but but become become a part of it. I, I guess I joined the cult, so um, I will be expecting my card in the mail. <laughs> also, hopefully, hopefully, I mean, I don't know how to contribute because I'm not a Christian, and this feels Christian. And sorry, and now I'm just ranting at this point. So, 
I'm listening. I'm listening. I mean, if this was like 500 years ago, Claire, we'd be killing each other. Just so you know. <laughs> we'd have killed, we'd have killed Claire a lot. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we don't do that. Um, <laughs> Love that. But that's not happening. I think my video is so far behind. Oh. You're muted now, Chad. My connection. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't happen in person. That is really weird looking. <laughs> well, now that I've ruined the whole thing. Uh, any final thoughts, uh, McMosive? Uh, only the Universalists shall be saved. Amen. You are God's silliest. Case. Claire, any final thoughts from you? No, I'm. I just. I'm feeling the love. So it's just really wonderful to see everyone and and to mm -hmm. to get to get to uh, to share this virtual space with y'all. Totally. Splendid, Mr. Allen. By the way, just so everybody knows, very. I want to be very clear about this. These screens do not capture the actual beauty <laughs> of people's faces. I'm dead serious on this. Alan's eyes are gorgeous. You cannot even see. Oh, now I <laughs> see McMo's beauty. <laughs> oh, yeah. I bet you, you, yes, your eyes look different too, real up close like that. But yeah, no, that's, I'm, I'm being referral on that, not to be mm -hmm. weird. But uh, I am weird. So, final thoughts, Mr. Alan. Just, uh, you know. Follow the spirit, and sometimes that means to stay, and sometimes that means to go. Mm -hmm. hmm. wow, I do so want to say that. Okay, I'll say my final thoughts after sharing. Share? I think I, I've shared my final thoughts. Um, I'm just grateful for the estuary group that we had today that I could th throw out just a, a whole crap load of trolley problems <laughs> and and get everyone's feedback and um because this is actually a real world thing um and yeah so yeah grateful for that lovely um, so my final thoughts are, I just, well, I want to thank everybody for coming, Neil and Matthew. Um, I can't thank you guys cause you're not here, but thank you. And then, so thank you, McMo, Clara, Alan, and Sherry as well. It was, it was really good to have this conversation and, um, just on the actual, um, the, 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 excuse me, the answer that Alan gave made me rethink my answer because I thought, yeah, like it, setting an example there is a a higher example i suppose that, that could be set in in the answer that you gave and i thought hmm yeah so but maybe that's why i also said i would have to talk to my wife first it's a similar mm -hmm. idea you definitely know, so and you didn't hear my answer and i think you'd like that one too <laughs> i can't wait to hear it because it sounded <laughs> like that I, yeah, I, <laughs> and then like all the bubbles were like going out i'm like i don't know i'm just gonna play guitar so. <laughs> all right guys well thank you everybody and thanks, uh chad. yeah thank you chad thanks guys thank you uh, enjoy life and stuff bye I don't know about the meaning crisis Left, right, black, white, or other vices But Jesus Christ is right Or if we're all saved From my perspective Our propositions Participate procedurally Running in circles When we're in body We're in the age of decay 
Symbolically speaking, the reapers are reaping. Them damn egregores are whispering sweetly. We're all NPCs in the belly of the beast. Red pill, blue pill, bread pill, Mars Hill, or DMT, or whatever you feel. Got one and number two, it's all the same damn thing. So clean your room, repent on Zoom, ontology for dummies, a bird's eye view. Cause if you really knew, could you really even say? Totally depraved, all totally saved A total disposition from the bed we all made Or is it the elect? Or are we just insane? From John Verbeke to Jonathan Pajot And Jordan Peterson to the Chris Pacu Show Paul Vander Clays and Griswold Grimm and all the dice he shakes. The sestuary ditty is a little bit cringy and quite the U-shaped or the hero's journey. All the NPCs in the flood dread and water to watch you save the day with a bunch of chitter chatter. From the ortho bros to the Catholic Joes, or atheistic Joes, to Protestant folks, the Joe Schmoes, and Jewish Jacobs, and everything in between. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind and your fingers and toes, all your neighbors too. As if they were your own So love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul And with all your mind and your fingers and toes All your neighbors too As if they were your own